I think start. Okay, let me so share my screen with you. Uh, and uh, you should be able hopefully to see this. Uh, what is it? Oh, here it is. So um, this evening I would like to take you on a journey on uh, this world of uh, this class of materials that you call two dimensional materials. And my idea here today is to tell you um, why uh, this class of materials is so interesting, what, what makes them so, uh, so uh, fantastic that uh, it has been receiving a lot of attention in the last, let's say, 17 years. And I will discuss the main properties of these materials and uh, we'll talk about uh, the most uh, popular uh, two-dimensional materials and some potential applications. And I hope you will enjoy this journey with me in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So um, to talk about two-dimensional materials, you need to talk about dimensionality. So uh, let's start with zero-dimensional materials. Zero-dimensional materials are fullerenes, organic molecules, quantum dots. This is a fullerene. Fullerene, it's a ball made of carbon atoms. It has, the most famous fullerene has 60 carbon atoms, but you have some different size of fullerenes. But fullerene, fullerene is a, a six carbon atoms arranged in pentagons and hexagons. And, uh, and, have, uh, uh, and this material has a dimension of, a uh, di diameter of about 0 0.7 nanometers. So if you look at this material, so you see that all the dimensions of a fullerene is in the scale of a nanometer. And uh, if you see a nanometer, nanometer, uh, just to remind you, it's about one billionth of a meter. So we get a meter and divided by one billion, we have a, a nanometer. So this is really, really, really small. So zero dimensional material is that material that all the dimensions of the material is on the scale of nanometers. Just to give you an idea of the size we are talking here, uh, if you get a football, uh, a FIFA football ball that we use, for example, the World Cup, it has, uh, that has 22 centimeters, it is about 300 million times smaller. The fullerene is 300 million times smaller than the football uh, ball. Now, if one of the dimensions uh, go out of the nanoscale uh, dimension, let's say, oh, what's happening? Okay, here. Let's say uh, one of the dimensions, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, larger than a nanometer, you have one dimensional material. So you have nanotubes, nanorodes, nanowires, they are all one dimensional materials. And then why they are one dimension? Because the two dimensions of this material is in the scale of a nanometer. And this is a carbon nanotube. It's a nanotube made of carbon atoms. And it has a diameter of around one or two nanometers, but the length of uh, the carbon nanotube is about few micrometers. So uh, we have here uh, one dimension that's much larger than the scale of a nanometer. And just for you to know, uh, 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 okay, one, I'm sorry, let me go back here. Um, one micrometer, it's about one million times smaller than one meter. Now, if, uh, if you extend now two dimensions beyond the nanoscale, uh, beyond the nanoscale uh, size, then you have a two-dimensional material. So it would be the dimensional material would be something like a piece of shit like this. You have two dimensions that are uh, in the scale of micrometers or larger, and one of the dimensions is very thin. So this is a two-dimensional material. You have uh, the thickness of the material, it's, it's smaller than one nanometer. But then the other dimensions in the order of a few uh, micrometers. So the two-dimensional material, so it has an area, but doesn't have a volume. It's very, very thin. And this is graphene, uh, but you can also have, that is one atom thick, or you can also have two-dimensional materials that are two, two, three, or four atoms thick. But they are still, all the dimensions are still uh, in the order of a small uh, few nanometers only. So this is a two-dimensional material. And just for completeness, I didn't put here a, 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 a figure of three-dimensional material, but in the three-dimensional material, obviously you can guess now that you have all the dimensions now out of the nanoscale uh, dimension. So, uh, so that's the famous two-dimensional material. It has just area, doesn't have volume, it's just few atoms, one or few atoms thick. Uh, and so the thickness in the scale of nanometers. 
And just to give you one idea, uh, for example, graphene, if you get one uh, a piece of a A4, A4 paper like this one, one um, layer of uh, graphene, that's the most famous two-dimensional material, would be like 500,000 times thinner than uh, this um, piece of shit here, okay? Uh, <clears throat> So, but why two-dimensional materials are so interesting? Well, uh, they are layered structures. So, uh, and they are thick. They are, uh, because of the layer structure and because of the thickness, they are uh, made in layered structure and they are very, very thin. We make them light, very lightweight and make them very flexible. So if you want to, to do an application, for example, where you want a material that's very thin and very flexible, two-dimensional material would be very interesting for that. It also has high surface area because everything in the two-dimensional material is about area. They don't have volume or almost don't have volume. So for example, if you take graphene, all the atoms of graphene is exposed to the environment. So you can, for example, if you want to use, if you want to build a sensor, so you do have made of graphene, for example, which have all the atoms of the, 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 the material exposed to the environment can collect, for example, toxic gas. So you have high exposure to the, the environment. So that's a good, uh, one good property of two-dimensional material. And also because you have reduced dimensionality and you have restricted geometry because atoms now, now I'm sorry, electrons now cannot move in a two-dimensional material in the same way that they would move in a, uh, in a three-dimensional material. So they have reduced, uh, reduced uh, motion there. So because they have reduced motion and reduced dimensionality, you have uh, an enhancement of the quantum effects and many electro interactions. And you have reduced screen, which gives us a new properties and phenomena. Let me just show you uh, one example here. This is a three-dimensional material. Let's say we get a three-dimensional material here and you have two point charges there, positive charge and a negative charge. You have an electron and a hole. And obviously, if you remember from, from your physics uh, basic question, you have interaction between these two uh, charges, that's Coulomb interaction. So electrons and holes will attract each other in this material. And here it's drawing here the, the, uh, the lines, the Coulomb lines that you'd have between these materials, between these charges. And then uh, when the material get, when these charges get very close to each other, the electrons between them cannot screen that much uh, the interaction between the, the electrons, the, the charges. So uh, uh, they, they attract each other very strongly and the screen is small. But once you, you remove them from apart, you have many electrons here between them and then the screen is higher and then uh, the interaction is slow, it's, it's small in this case. So you have high dielectric screen, uh, the dielectric screen goes and uh, saturates in some point as a function of the distance. Now, when you go to a two-dimensional material, what you see is this, okay? So you have, again, now two charges, positive and negative charge in this uh, material. And again, when the, when the charges are very close to each other, you have screen from the electrons between the charges here. And you have uh, a small screen because you have few electrons that screen the, the interaction. But once you move the, the, the charge far apart from each other, we still have uh, a screen. But what happens is that when you move the charge far from each other, the dielectric uh, lines, they go out of the sample. And so they are not uh, act, uh, acting the charge. So you would have a uh, uh, reduced screen again. So in the two-dimensional material, the screen would be reduced for large, for for, for particles far away from each other because the lights, the lines of uh, the, the Coulomb field, they go outside the sample. So what you have here is that in, in two-dimensional material, uh, the, 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 Coulomb interaction, the, the Coulomb interaction between the particles is enhanced and the dielectric function is uh, reduced. And what you have is that charges, positive and negative charge that you create in the material they are strongly bound in uh, two-dimensional materials. So what you call X combining energy, for example, when you say uh, a material generates charge, for example, for a solar cell, the charge will be uh, strongly bound in two-dimensional materials, more strongly than in three-dimensional three -dimensional material because you have reduced the screen uh, in the systems. And also, if obviously two-dimensional materials is, is uh, one layer, a few layers of material. And obviously when you're going to put this in a, 
in a real device, you have to put it on top of something, on top of a substrate. And obviously, because the, the Coulomb lines, they go out of the material, they will be interactive with the substrate. And substrates here really have a very strong influence into dimensional material and how the charge behave into dimensional material. Okay, so uh, this leads to some different properties that we are going to see and the phenomena that we will observe uh, into dimensional material. And another thing is, uh, for example, speaking of new properties and phenomena that we observe into dimensional material because of the reduced, the reduced dimensionality and because of the reduced screening, you have, for example, this is a band structure of molybdenum disulfide. We are going to see that they are one of the most famous two-dimensional materials. Uh, and they have a bulk, we have a bulk, a three-dimensional three uh, form of molybdenum disulfide. And in three-dimension, that's the, the, the black curve, they are indirect, they have indirect band gap and a small indirect band gap. But it turns out that this indirect band gap came mainly from the, the interaction between the layers. And then when we, when we go from the, the bulk three-dimensional material to the two-dimensional layer, you see that uh, this is the, the red curve now, you see that uh, the, layer, the, the bands goes up, the, 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 the conduction band goes up here and the valence band goes down here. And what you have is that the mono layer is a direct band gap. So it is an effect of a reduced, uh, reduced dimension, dimensionality to dimensional material. You have transitions from, direct, from indirect band gap to direct band gap and to dimensional material. And this changed totally how you can use the material for applications, for technological applications. So uh, uh, we all, I, I bet you all heard about graphene. Graphene is the most famous two dimensional material. And I would say that it was graphene who starts the, ra the race for uh, two dimensional material and brought all the attention for this class of material. Well, graphene was first uh, isolated in 2004, not too far from here at the University of Manchester by um, Andregeim, uh, Sir Andregeim and Professor Konstantin Novoselov uh, from the University of Manchester, as I said. And um, they first isolated, gra isolated graphene in 2004, but there was a lot of research on graphene since the 1947 was the first uh, study on graphene, but they were all uh, theoretical studies. There were some studies on graphene in 1947, and uh, some interesting properties were, were already reviewed there, but uh, nobody believed that you could have, in fact, one very thin atom, one atom thick, only uh, that should be stable. So people did some, some theoretical calculations on, on this material, but they let it go because, oh, it's probably not stable. You probably go to the row over in another tubes or going to curl in a kind of a uh, fullerene. So they don't thought it would be, would be um, stable. And then what, and there was some attempt in, in, the, the, in the beginning of the uh, 2000 and, and so around 1919, 1980, 1990, there was already some, some attempts to, to isolate graphene, but nobody was able to isolate the one single layer of graphene. So people believed it was not possible to have one single layer of graphene. And so uh, what happened is that these two um, researchers, they, they used to like to, I mean, on Friday evenings, they used to, to like to play with science and do something different from their main project. So uh, every Friday evening, they decide to do something different. And one evening, they were playing with uh, graphite. Graphite, what you use, um, uh, this material that comes in your pencil, it's graphite. And, and they were playing with a crystal of graphite and with squat tape. And then they decided to start to peel off uh, graphite using squat tape. Just put squat tape there and peel off. And they did this several times and they were observing what they, they, they got there. And as they do this, uh, as they did this uh, several times, in some moment they got one monolayer of graphene, one only one, one layer of graphite. And then they managed to uh, uh, put this uh, layer in a silicon substrate and do some measurements of electrical conductance and so on in this material. And they finally found uh, that graphene was stable and was possible to have a single monolayer 
and they start to find some very interesting properties about conductivity of graphene. And then because of this uh, fun uh, Friday evening, they won the Nobel Prize in 2010 for their groundbreaking uh, research on graphene. And then uh, the race for two-dimensional materials started and they start uh, um, uh, exploring this material. And, uh, and as I said, they, they found it from graphite. Graphite is this uh, uh, structure here. It's an allotrope of carbon. You have carbon in form of graphite. You have carbon in form of diamond, non carbon nanotube, fullerene. And graphite is the most stable uh, form of graph uh, of carbon in a uh, standard condition. If you want to get um, diamond, for example, you have to apply high temperature and high pressure. And so in standard condition, room temperature and standard pressure, you would have graphite. And graphite, it's it's very common material. You have it graphite in your pencils. You have graphite. Graphite, for example, is used as, as a lubricant. So you probably, by writing down your essays or whatever, you probably already got some layers of graphene when you are writing down uh, something with pencil. But uh, uh, you didn't manage to isolate them and you didn't want a Nobel Prize. So um, graphite, it's this uh, form of graph uh, carbon that's made of layers of carbon. And the uh, carbon atoms, they are very strongly bound in the, in the implant layers and via covalent bonds. And the, the, the out of plane um, interaction between these layers, they are made via van der Waals force. That's very weak uh, interaction. So it's very easy to really move uh, and remove some of the layers of graphite. And if you remove one of the layers of graphite, you have graphene. Uh, graphene has remarkable properties. Once I, well, I attended one of the talks of other guy, and um, he was saying that graphite, graphene is the material of superlatives, and is it, it really is. It is uh, the most of a, a lot of things. So it is very simple. Graphene is really simple. It has this honeycomb structure, a hexagonal structure made of carbon. The carbon atoms, they are connected via single and double bonds in the, uh, on graphene. And they are very strong bonds, single dangle bonds. They are very strong bonds here. It is very difficult to break the, the, the covalent bonds in, in, in graphene. And they, um, they, 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 uh, um, they, are, they have sp2 hybridization, which means that the electrons, uh, each, each one of these carbons is connected to three other carbon and they form sp2 hybridization, which means that the bonds here are formed by s and p orbitals. The PZ orbitals, the PZ orbitals, they are uh, they, 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 they are they, they localized, they are not found here. And this is what makes graphene quite a good conductor. And, um, and this sp2 hybridization of graphene, it's what makes graphene very strong. It's a very strong material. Uh, and uh, it's one, it's the most strong, the strongest material that you will know so far. And it's very light because it's just one atom thick. So it's very lightweight and very thin and has a large surface area. So uh, you can say, uh, some, some calculators point out that you need 0 0.77 uh, milligrams to cover one meter square, uh, one area of one meter square. This means that with a little more than five grams, you could cover a football uh, field that has about 7,000 meters square. So it can really cover a large area of with, with graphene because it has a large surface area. Mm. Uh, it also has, it's also very elastic, although it's very strong and the bones are very strong and hard to break the implant, they are very elastic and they can, uh, graphene can be stretched by about 25% of the original length without break. And this makes graphene very flexible, which is really good for applications, for example, where you, you need flexible device. Let's say you want to, um, to build one uh, watch, for example, for your, uh, to put graphene in your uh, smartwatch, for example, and then you need to bend it uh, in the surface. So it's a very interesting material for this kind of application. So it's very elastic. It's also an excellent thermal and electrical, it has an excellent thermal and electrical conductivity. The, 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 the electrical conductivity of graphene, it's about, it's larger than the copper, and the thermal conductivity is also four times larger than copper. 
I forgot to say that I, I told you that graphene is the strongest material that we know. And just to make a comparison, it's about 100 times stronger than steel and four times stronger than, than diamond. So it's really a strong material. And uh, graphene has high mobility, which is good for uh, electronics. And uh, it's almost transparent. You cannot, uh, you just absorb about 2% of a light. And, but it's extremely dense. Although it's transparent, it's extremely dense. Because the, these rings in the graphene is packed, it's heavily packed with uh, electrons, even a helium atom, that's the smallest gas atom that we know, cannot go through graphene. So it's extremely dense. And what's also remarkable about the graphene, it just has unique and exceptional electronic properties. Uh, you probably saw this already, this, uh, this picture. It is it's, uh, the firm surface of graphene. And if you look at the firm surface of graphene, you see that graphene in the uh, high symmetry points of the Brillouin zone, they don't have a band structure like the other, super, uh, uh, the other materials, not uh, uh, parabolic behavior, uh, parabolic like uh, band structure like the other materials. Band structure of graphene is rather different from the other materials. And it has some kind of uh, cones. And if you look at the firm surface of the graphene, you see that it has six double cones in the high uh, symmetry points here. And these cones, they are formed because it, graphene has uh, two uh, uh, sublattices, uh, uh, sub that equivalent sublattices that are called A and B. And <clears throat> when you look at the, uh, the hopping of the sublattices, we see that uh, uh, the band structure of graphene, they, they, are, they form like cosine-like uh, band structures. And when the band structures come close to each other in the high uh, symmetry points, they form, they overlap and form these Dirac cones. And what is it? We call them Dirac cones. They are cones and we call them Dirac cones because you are going to see, I'm going to tell you soon that uh, the, the electrons in the graphene, they're described by the Dirac equation, not by the Schrodinger equation. Why? Because if you look at the band structure of graphene around the Fermi level, the band structure is not parabolic, but it has a linear dispersion with respect to the momentum. And uh, I just moved something here. And it, it is uh, very close to the Fermi level. It's about 100 uh, milli electron volts close to the Fermi level. The dispersion is linear. And if you remember that effective mass it is obtained from the curvature of the, um, the band structure. Uh, this material, because it is, has a linear dispersion, it has a zero effective mass, which means that the electrons see it behave as massless particles. And so they have a, a kind of relativistic behavior. And because of this, they are described by the Dirac equation, not by the, the Schrodinger equation. So you say that in graphene, you have Dirac massless fermions. And this is really interesting. And this brings very interesting properties to graphene. Um, well, here in the, a, little bit, a little bit more of what I want to say here. Uh, in this, uh, the Dirac quantity cross exactly the Fermi level. And because of this, the, the, uh, graphene is considered to be a semi-metal. A semi-metal is that, that there is uh, a small overlap between conduction band and valence band. So this is a semi-metal material. But uh, undoped graphene crosses exactly uh, the Fermi level. So undoped graphene, because we have a very small density of states in the Fermi level, it has a low uh, mobility. But when you go, uh, when you dope graphene, that you move Fermi level up or down, and then you have high, high mobility in graphene. And this makes uh, graphene really interesting for, for electronic applications. And well, because graphene has Dirac uh, massless fermion, it has kind of relativistic behavior. Some of the properties of the quantum electrodynamics can be found in graphene. Uh, for example, you can observe in graphene, you can observe uh, the Klein tunneling. Klein tunneling is uh, in conventional semiconductors, one particle, when they, they, they see a barrier, they can tunnel to the barrier, 
but the wave function of this uh, particle will decay exponentially with the width and the height of the barrier. So we here, if you see that this is the, the size of the wave function, you see a particle with a, high wave, a big wave function arriving, but just few of this wave function will pass through the, the, the barrier and some, most of them will be uh, reflected. Graphene, no, graphene pretty much doesn't see the barrier. It seems like the barrier doesn't exist or it's transparent. So the wave function of graphene remains practically constant when uh, graphene is crossing a barrier. It doesn't matter the height or the width of the barrier. And this is uh, a behavior that's observed in, in relativistic particles. So, so the unique properties of uh, electronic properties of graphene gives graphene this uh, relativistic behavior. So, um, so graphene is really a wonderful material. We saw a lot of nice properties, electronic mechanical properties, uh, thermoelectric properties, and uh, electrical properties. So you have plenty of applications that uh, uh, has been uh, developing for graphene. And I will mention some of them here, and most of them are really in development or uh, in the initial stage of development. So graphene is a very interesting material to be used as a composite material because uh, uh, graphene is really strong material and it's thin and lightweight. So you can use, for example, graphene to reinforce aerospace, uh, uh, airplanes, and car cars, for example. For example, this is one prototype of airplane where they use graphene to, to, to make a reinforcement of this, the structure of the airplane. And it's good because it, once, since graphene is a very light material, you can really build one aircraft with much less material than you do use from regular materials. So you uh, uh, reduce the amount of fuel you need, for example, for, a, for the same travel. And for example, in, in, in cars, you can use graphene to reinforce uh, the structure of the car and absorb uh, uh, the impact in a crash, for example, and reduce the damage to the people that is inside the car. You can also use a graphene, for example, in concrete and to reinforce uh, building materials. And uh, there are some already some, uh, some uh, advanced studies on this and people, there are some, uh, companies already doing, using graphene on the concrete and they observe that graphene can reduce by 30% the amount of concrete that they use to have the same performance. And that's really interesting because concrete is one of the most uh, um, CO2 emitters that you have in the world. Production of, 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 of concrete, it emits 8% of the CO2 uh, in the whole world. If it, Production of concrete is a, will be a country, it will be the third one in production of CO2 just behind China and the US. So if you can reduce the amount of concrete that you use to build the same thing, you can reduce the amount of CO2 you are producing so we can reduce carbon footprint. And also to make uh, graphene has been used in sporting goods, for example, in, to make light running shoes and uh, better performance uh, in, for example, tennis rackets and so. And can also use graphene for coating, because graphene it's very it's water resistant, and that not, it, it also uh, acts as an antibacterial agent. So you can uh, use graphene to paint, for example, cars and ships, and reduce uh, rust corrosion of these uh, 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 cars and ships. So, for example, this is a photo of one ship that has been already uh, uh, painted with uh, carbon coating, and uh, What's good about this is that uh, <clears throat> graphene is very strong. So usually the normal coat that they, coating that they put uh, with time because of the moving cargo and because of the anchor and uh, you can scratch the coat and, and review the, the, the metal underneath. So the coat is not very that durable. And also most of the coating that they use uh, in this kind of uh, sheep, sheep, uh, ships, they are uh, made of aluminum and zinc, which is, is not good for um, the ocean ecology. So graphene is more biocompatible. Uh, you can also use graphene, for example, for waterproofing buildings, waterproofing clothes, and for food packaging, because graphene can reduce, because of the uh, permeability of the graphene, you can reduce the transfer of water and oxygen molecules to the food, and you can increase the durability of the food. Uh, can use obviously uh, graphene in electronic device. Since graphene is transparent, you can use graphene touch screens and circuits and flexible memories. Um, 
This is in a very initial stage of development, but, but graphene has been intensively studied for biomedical applications, for example, drug delivery, DNA sequencing, and because graphene is really strong material to also to make tissue and bone engineering. Uh, for energy applications in batteries, supercapacitors, because graphene has high conductivity, high thermal conductivity, photovoltaics and catalysis. Uh, as membrane, you, uh, water, uh, graphene has been used, uh, studied for water filtration, water desalination, that's one problem, for example, and of the world is water and how you can use the water from the sea, for example. And you can also use a graphene, obviously, because it has a high surface area for sensor applications. You can use to detect toxic gases and detect, also detect biologic agents. And also detect, for example, you can put graphene in, in, in sensors uh, made of graphene in buildings and bridges to detect strain and stress. And one point that I want to make here before I move to the next is uh, graphene is a multifunctional material. So uh, some, it, it, it's one of the few most functional materials that you have. So sometimes you have one device, you can use graphene for more than one application in the same device. You don't need to choose more than one material for for, for main applications that you want to apply. So uh, that's one important thing about graphene too. So I said uh, a lot about graphene and I could say much more about graphene, but this I want to talk about all the two dimensional materials. Uh, uh, it's quite sad that you should uh, have a break about five minutes break. I think now it's a good time that before I, I move to the other two dimensional materials uh, to have a break if you were okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Juliana. Yeah, that's a perfect time for, for a break. So for those that are used to our talks, um, if you are not requiring Stephen's excellent interpretation, you can go and fill your glasses with your uh, drink of choice. Um, otherwise, if you've got any questions for Juliana, now would be a fantastic time to pop them in the chat box. Um, if I feel it's per pertinent, we can ask them before the start of the second half or we can save them till the end. So if you do have any questions, and I've started writing a few down, um, please do pop them in the chat uh, function and we will happily uh, try and address those at the end of the talk. So it's now 9.37, we will resume at just gone 9.40. So we're gonna give ourselves four minutes. See you shortly.
Fantastic. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm sure Stephen will be joining us. Yes, fantastic. Uh, welcome back, everybody. And thank you to uh, those of you that have posted some questions in the chat box. I'm going to break from tradition um, for tonight. I'm going to ask a couple of questions now, Julian, if you don't mind, because I think it's pertinent to uh, graphene in particular. And then we can move on to some of these other materials, which I think we'll probably have some more questions for afterwards. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, I'm actually going to start this in a slightly different order. So I'm going to start with Elnor, who's asked, um, well, in fact, Eleanor to begin with, actually, what makes this material specifically 2D, as everything is made of some variation of elements, so therefore shouldn't all, or shouldn't be some sort of three dimension in every object? So I guess, what's the definition of a 2D object in comparison to a 3D material? Yeah, uh, what makes a 2D is that the, the thickness of this material is in, this, in the scale of nano, nanometers. And so you have like, a, Zero point, like graphene is 0 0.3 nanometers thick. And the other two dimensions, they are in the scale of micrometers. That's 1,000 uh, times larger. So it's like you imagine like indeed a piece of sheet like this, and then you, a sheet like this, and then you have very, very thin dimension here. It's kind of scale of nanometers. And the other two dimensions, they are in the scale of micrometers. So with that, to make each two dimensional material. You don't have volume, actually. You can just think about area, not volume in this kind of materials. Fantastic. Thank you, Juliana. Great. And then the next two questions are kind of um, tied together, really. The first one from uh, Penelope, and I think it's more about the application of graphene. She's put, since graphene is so thin, how is it handled in these various applications? So I'm thinking maybe about that aeroplane or applying it to the ship. How is, how is it handled? I know you said it was strong, but how does it not tear? Or you know, how do you actually apply it in these particular applications? Uh, you can, for example, mix it with uh, other, what people is doing, for example, let's say in concrete and in and, and, and airplane, it's mixed to the graphene with all the two dimensional material, I'm sorry, with all the materials that's already, uh, that's already used to build airplanes. So you put graphene on top of these materials and make this, ma the, this material stronger. And, uh, and but, but as it makes this material stronger, you don't need to use too much of this material. So you can reduce the, the quantity of regular traditional materials, and then you put graphene on top of them or mix it with, with the material. And then you can have, uh, you apply it in airplanes or concrete. They are mixed, they can make little composite indeed. Superb, brilliant. And there's one final question from Elnoy, which I guess takes that one step further. Um, where, which field do you think graphene will have the biggest impact in? Will it be aviation? Will it be construction? Or do you, or do you think it will have an equal um, weighting in all of those and possibly some others we haven't even thought about yet, potentially? Uh, at, at this moment, I would say aviation and, and uh, um, uh, buildings, for example, concrete, these things, they are, they are ahead of time because you, the industry are already applying them. There's already prototypes that's, for example, concrete that is already one industry just already doing concrete with graphene. So they are advanced in this, uh, the systems. But for example, you come now biometric application that's assuming the very initial stage. But if you really can use graphene, for example, for bony tissues and cancer treatments, and I think that may take over because of the I mean, that feeling that this you have uh, for the society. But, but I would say that at this moment, I would say that uh, compositis is the most advanced one. And the coating that I, I showed that is already some, some application, real life applications of graphene. Uh, but, 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 my, my, but I believe our biometric applications can, can take over if you feel really advanced on all that because of the appealing that this you will have for the society. Really? That's really interesting. Thank you, Joe. I've just had a friend who's had a knee operation, so I've got, I've got thoughts now about where, where you could use graphene in some of those contexts. Anyway, um, I digress. I'm going to hand back to you now for, our, for the second half of our talk. So back to you, Juliana. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we talk a lot about graphene now, but as I said, graphene started the race. So uh, Andra Geim and Konstantin Novozolov, they, they, they managed to isolate one layer of graphene and show that it was possible to have one thin one, one very thin, one atom thick material that is stable and don't, don't roll up back and don't break and so on. So, and then people start, okay, so we have all the layered materials like graphite. So what about we start peeling off and try to isolate other two dimensional materials? And then the race starts. For example, just to show you some examples of uh, layered materials that we have, that is very few examples. We have a lot more uh, layered materials. For example, black phosphorus is a layered material. 
hexagonal boron nitride, it's a layered material. Molybdenum disulfide is layered material. So they are layered material held, uh, held together. The layers are held together by Van der Waals forces like graphite. So you can easily break this uh, force, Van der Waals force, and have two dimensional materials made of those uh, systems. And people start uh, 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 doing a lot of research, theoretical and uh, experimental research on these materials, trying to synthesize and study the properties of other two-dimensional materials. And now we have a very large family of two-dimensional materials, and it is increasing, the increasing here between parentheses, because every year you, you have new materials being isolated, being synthesized. So graphene, as I said, is a semi-metal, uh, has zero band gap, and it's really good for a lot of applications because it has all, all the properties that I told you. But graphene is not good for electronic applications because it has zero band gap. And for some electronic applications, you need a material that has a band gap, you need a semiconductor material. So, but you have now, people have found very, uh, a lot of other two-dimensional materials that can be uh, several different, have, uh, used for several different applications because they have very different properties. So besides the same metal like graphene, silicine, you have semiconductor material, a huge uh, number of semiconductor materials like molybdenum disulfide and all the transition metal that are cotonized. I will talk about this here. You have metal materials, you have insulator materials like uh, boron nitride, I will talk about them too, <coughs> excuse me. We also have superconductor materials and you have ferromagnetic materials. So if you see now here, you can pretty much use two-dimensional materials for all applications you can think about because you have materials that has very different properties here. So obviously I am not going to talk about all these materials. You don't, you don't want to have me talking here for the whole night. So I will talk just about some of the most famous two-dimensional materials beside, beyond graphene. So I would say that the second one, in my opinion, is transition metal ditrocogenides. Transition metal ditrocogenides, they, they have this structure. They are not one atom thick, but three atoms thick. But again, if you see here, there was a question, I think it was Eleanor. Uh, it's, the thickness is really faint. It's less than one nanometer, but the length the, the other two dimensions extends for a few micrometers. So these uh, transition metal tracogenides, they are made of a sandwich between chalcogen atoms that are these yellow uh, balls here, it can be sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. And in the middle here, you have transition metal atom that could be molybdenum or tungsten. And these materials, they have very nice properties. They are semiconductor. <coughs> Excuse me. They are semiconductor, they have large direct band gap between 1.5 and 2.5, depending on what combination you are doing here. And they also have a uh, high carrier mobility and they also absorb light in the visible spectrum. That is good for, for example, solar cells, you want to absorb solar light, so you want to absorb the visible spectrum. And um, uh, as I said, they have, the, the, they have a direct band gap, I already showed this to you. Most of the, the bulk systems of transition metal tracogenides, they have indirect band gap and a small band gap. But when you go to the monolayer system, you have a large direct band gap, which for some applications, for example, solar cells, it is an interesting uh, material because you want a material that has a direct band gap and a relatively large band gap. Other thing is that, that these materials, they absorb very well in the visible absorption, the, 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 the visible uh, spectrum. And you can see here, this is a, a theoretical study showing that there is some absorption, this A, B, A prime, and B prime peaks, about 20% of absorption uh, in the, the, the range of 1.5 to 2.5 ele electron volts, which is in the visible spectrum. And I will talk a little bit more about this in, in a minute. Uh, also, these materials, they have molybdenum or tungsten, which are very heavy atoms. So it's a spin of the coupling, that's the interaction between spins of the electrons and the, the orbital motion of the electrons, they are very strong in these atoms. And what they cause, they cause the splitting of the, valence, the, the conduction of the valence band. So the conduction band is split very little, about three milli electron volts, and the conduction band, I'm sorry, the conduction band is split very little, about three milli electron volts, but the valence band has a large split about 150 milli electron volts. And what happens is that because of this split, they have uh, some optical, uh, different optical rules here where electrons, they can, they can excite in different ways depending on uh, uh, the light that they, they, they absorb. If they absorb 
a left uh, uh, hand uh, circular light, one of the values uh, uh, emit in if they absorb uh, uh, right hand circular lights, another uh, uh, that is an excitation, the other value. And this leads to um, what they call valetronics. And also, these materials have, because of these different values, and they have uh, what they call value hall effect. Uh, if you see here, uh, spins of the electrons, they are different if you are in the K or K prime value. And so uh, electrons diffract in a different way, deflect, in a, I'm sorry, deflect in a different way if you are talking about electrons that is one value on another value. And that's interesting because in addition to charge and spin of the electrons, we can also explore now the, 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 value, the value degree of the freedom of the electrons. And we can use this information, we can use the value of the, of the uh, material to process uh, information. Instead of use, for example, uh, in quantum computing, you use spins or the charge of the electrons as a zero and one, for example, for, for, for computing information, you can use the, the, the value in index of the letter of the, of the material for processing information. Your, your, the index can be zero or one, and you can uh, store information uh, using the value of the electrons. It's what call, uh, people is calling uh, valetronics. You can explore the value of the electron, of the, the material uh, for technological applications, for electronic applications and quantum computing. Uh, these materials, because they have large direct band gap and large carrier mobility, you can use it, for example, as transistors or photodetectors. This is just some uh, applications. But let me just tell you here already that although, for example, I told you that graphene, we have a lot of applications already in industry and, and some industry already producing materials with graphene. For all the other two-dimensional materials, they're still in the level of research, pretty much. Okay, so it's not as much as advanced as uh, uh, graphene in terms of development. But uh, you have a lot of research going on and find very nice applications, for example, for these materials. For example, molybdenum disulfide can be used for photo, photo detectors. Can also, could also be potentially used in solar cells. And this is one uh, uh, study showing that uh, molybdenum disulfide absorbs, if you, if you get five nanometers of molybdenum disulfide, 0.5 nanometers of molybdenum disulfide, you can absorb 20% of the solar spectrum. While silicon, that's the most uh, common uh, material used in solar cells, you can absorb just 0.02%. So what this means? This means that you can reduce the amount of material that you can use to build a solar cell. And if you want, for example, to build a solar cell <clears throat> to charge your smartphone, so you want a small solar cell to put there. So uh, this can be, for example, have applications for portable devices where we would use a much lighter and much less material to, to do the same, uh, to have the same performance. So here it's a study just showing that when you apply, when you put a layer of molybdenum disulfide in a solar cell, for example, in the device with silicon, you increase uh, by like 10 or 20% the efficiency of the solar cell in this case. And we also can use, because of these materials, they have high surface to volume ratio because you have large surface area. And they have also a, a high absorption coefficient, absorption coefficient. You can use also for sensors, for example. And here, this is a study showing that molybdenum disulfide is really very sensitive to a molecules, toxic molecules, toxic gases like NO2, for example. And then you can see that even high temperature, the sensibility is really high. So if you want to use, for example, to, to, to create a sensor to detect uh, uh, um, toxic gas in the atmosphere, so you could, do, for example, use uh, molybdenum disulfide for that. And we really need much smaller and much less material to build the same sensor. So another two-dimensional material really uh, uh, popular is the boron nitride, the hexagonal boron nitride. It has a structure very similar to graphene. It's really similar to graphene. But instead of just carbon, you have boron and nitrogen here. So blue and, 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 and pink uh, balls here, boron and nitrogen. And they are, they are organized in a hexagonal structure like graphene. Uh, and they, but, but uh, uh, opposite to graphene, they are insulator material. They have a very, very large band gap. It's the only insulator two-dimensional material known so far. And they are really robust because of the bonds and, 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 and bond, bonds between boron and nitrogen. They are really strong material too, really robust. They also have uh, high thermal and uh, chemical stability. 
and uh, they have excellent impermeability. And because of this, uh, for example, they can be used, for example, for uh, energy storage in uh, high demand environments. For example, if you have a place where you have high temperature or exposed to gases or, uh, water, or exposed, exposed to water and so, and you want to have an, uh, uh, an energy storage in such a very harsh environment, bottom nitrate could be a good idea for that. There are also, this is one paper, one application that they are using bottom nitrate, is for using in light, uh, lithium batteries. Here, for example, you have a lithium battery and here you have this material that's lithium, aluminum, titanium phosphate. <laughs> And uh, this uh, material, they react very strongly with lithium. So as the, 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 the battery starts working and uh, lithium goes uh, and starts uh, reacting with this uh, surface here and start producing these uh, uh, reduction products here, which reduce the lifetime of the battery as the battery goes running and this start to accumulate, the battery start to work, stop, stop working. So, uh, once you put bottle nitride, you can uh, kind of protect this uh, uh, surface without changing the, the performance of the battery. And what happened is that a battery that used, for example, to, to work for eight to one hours would now work for 500 hours. So we really want some, and we really want to our smartphone, for example, to last one week battery, not one day. So uh, that can be one idea, for example. And it uh, can also be used as encapsulation because of this excellent permeabilities here. And uh, the third material that I wanted to show you, that's the last one, is phosphorine. Phosphorine comes from black, black phosphorus. It's, it, they are nice because they have this puckered structure. It's not flat structure like the other three materials, I'm uh, the other, the, the graphene and, and bottom nitride, but it has this puckered structure here, and uh, which makes them really anisotropic nice, because the way that the, the, the phosphorus atoms is organized here, the, when you look at the properties of the mater that this material, it's very different if you look along the armchair direction, that's this direction, or if you look along the zig zigzag direction because of this structure. And um, it has an isotropic optical transport properties. For example, uh, mobilities are very different when you look along the armchair or, or zigzag direction. And it has high carrier mobility. It's a semiconductor material uh, with a band gap of two electron volts. And it's very strong material too, and has unusual properties because of the puckered structure. What happens is that the young, uh, young, uh, young modulus of this material, what measure how the material reacts, for example, to strain, it really depends on the direction you are looking. Here it is, this, this um, theoretical results show that the young modulus, it's much larger along the zigzag direction than the armchair direction. So if you stretch the material along one direction or the other direction, the material will react in a different way. This is also, uh, it also has a negative Poisson ratio. Poisson ratio tells you that, well, when you stretch material along one direction, it tends to expand along the other direction. This is the positive Poisson ratio. But for uh, phosphorine, in some moment, uh, after some strain, when you expand the material, when we apply strain to one material, instead of, uh, let's say, when we compress one material, instead of expand, it's going to compress again. This is because of so the structure, the way that the, the atoms here absorb this compression or the uh, uh, strain will uh, change and uh, instead of the, uh, expand, it will contract in the other direction. So it has an unusual behavior uh, when you are applying strain. And also can be used because of all these properties several different applications you can use, for example, for guy sensor, thermoelectric applications, because it has kind of high carrier mobility and high thermal conductivity and um, <clears throat> gas sensors and so on. So I talked a lot about uh, two-dimensional materials and, uh, and I think I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm going very quickly here. Uh, I'll just very quickly talk about how you can synthesize two-dimensional materials. You can do a uh, synthesis of two-dimensional material by mechanical exfoliation, like we did, for example, uh, Andre Geim did for, for graphing, for example, you uh, applied uh, a, like squat tape and you removed two, uh, two dimensional material by cleavage of this uh, uh, exfoliate material. And this is a top down method. 
which means that we are uh, come, you, you bring a, a, a big crystal like graphite, and then you peel graphite and remove the layers and you get the two-dimensional material. And then it's done by applied for a driving force external strain in this material. And there are several agents. I'm not going to go through this, I will not have time. But um, this is a simple procedure, very cheap procedure, but it's very time consuming because you have to be peeling the material several, several times to get the, the one uh, monolayer of material, for example. And we can also uh, not, we have no control of uh, defects that you can create on this material. Uh, mechanical force, because you are just peeling uh, the material, for example, you can create a lot of defects and then not always you want defects in this kind of materials. Um, you can also exfoliate two-dimensional material by uh, using some kind of a chemical reaction, some molecule or, or, or ions or, uh, or uh, salts, and you can put the two-dimensional materials in a, in, a, in, a, in a solution with some molecules or ions or salt, and then the molecules and ions, they go inside uh, between the layers and help to, to fill the layers. That's a really interesting way to, to get large, and uh, size uh, two-dimensional materials, but you have problems of contamination and defects too, because we are putting molecules or the agent, chemical agents here. And the favorite way to produce two-dimensional materials now, uh, it's chemical vapor deposition, where you use a furnace, very hot, a uh, high temperature, and we throw gas inside this furnace. And the gas, let's say for graphene, it's uh, a carbon hydrocarbonate here, C, uh, CH4. And because of the high temperature, the gas CO2 evaporates and the carbon, they, they land in the substrate. This is a usually metallic substrate and they reorganize themselves forming layers of graphene. So for example, if you want to produce molybdenum disulfide, so you have to use a gas a precursor that they call a gas that has sulfur and two gases actually, one has sulfur and another one has molybdenum. And then when they evaporate, and you have this molybdenum and sulfur and they reorganize form into dimensional, the, the molybdenum disulfide. And this is the most favorable method to, to build two dimensional materials. But the problem is that it requires high temperature, high vacuum, and we also need to use a metal, uh, metallic catalyst here where you are going to put your two dimensional material. And obviously you need to transfer later this two dimensional material to other place where you are going to build your device. And when you do this transfer, you can damage the two dimensional material, you can also damage the surface. So uh, this is where we stand. These are three of the techniques, not all of the techniques. This is in development. There are a lot of uh, research on how to develop better ways to develop two dimensional materials in large scale than you can use in industry, these materials. But these are the two, three most uh, popular ones. And uh, just briefly, very briefly, I want to say two things very important about two-dimensional materials. What makes two-dimensional material also very interesting is that you can, you can isolate them and have single layers of two-dimensional material, but now you can put them together now forming what you call van der Waals heterostructures. You can get one layer of graphene, put on top of uh, bottom nitride and put on top of molybdenum disulfide and so build a heterostructure, heterostructure that are bound by uh, 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 van der Waals interactions. They are very uh, weakly bound, but uh, the, 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 the interaction between them is strong enough that you can affect the, the properties of the materials and you can create a total different material than what you have. And that is interesting because maybe we, we need uh, material for with some properties that you don't have in the individual components, but you can now build so these heterostructures and you can have some very different material with a property that you are not having in the individual materials. And once you can put the systems together and on top of each other building these heterostructures, you have now uh, uh, a huge number of possibilities that you can combine into dimensional materials. You can also rotate the two-dimensional materials once you put on top of each other, you can rotate them. And this is particular of two-dimensional materials, it's unprecedented. Then no other material can be doing this. You can put on top of each other and rotate because you have strong interaction between these materials. But in two-dimensional materials, you can do it. And interestingly, this is, uh, this is for twisted bilayer graphene. When you do it and rotate it on a magical angle that you call that it's about 1.1 angstrom, I'm, I'm sorry, degrees, not angstrom, 1.1 degrees, you have the formation of flat bands. That is this. Uh, 
the Jiraquicons of the two uh, layers, they came together very close to each other and in this exact layer of 1.2, around 1.1 degrees, the bands very close to the Fermi level, they become flat. And flat bands, they, 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 they don't have resistance and they, they, they become superconductor uh, in, at, at low temperature. So you have here uh, the production of superconducting material with twisted uh, graph, uh, twisted by layer graphing. And that opens up a lot of possibilities that you can do with this, a lot of research on twisted two dimensional materials, what you call twistronic now, because now you, what, what else you can get from twisting uh, uh, two dimensional materials on top of each other? If you, go, you got superconduct, superconductivity in graphing, maybe you can get some very interesting properties in other materials. And there are people investigate, for example, three layers of graphene and twist them and see what you can get. So there is about two dimensional materials, there is a lot of possibilities that you can do. And a lot of research is a very hot topic and there's a lot yet to discover. Although it has been 17 years, we are working on that. There's a lot yet to be done and a lot of new things happening uh, uh, the, uh, recently, for example, this twisted by layer graphene came out in 19, in three years ago only. So there's a lot happening yet. There's a lot of things that you can still discover. So just to finish my, my talk, this is I show you this increasing family of two dimensional materials. We can add now Van der Waals heterostructures twisted, twisted by layer, twisted multi layers actually. And you can add all the applications you could have with these two dimensional materials. Several applications that you can uh, uh, try here with these materials. And also two new applications that's exclusive of two dimensional materials that's valetronics and twistronics. And so thank you all uh, uh, for staying here with me, for, for, for um, uh, listening to me today. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Juliana. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to indulge myself first, if that's all right. I always, as the, as the host, I think I always get to ask the first question. So um, it was interesting that for me, a lot of those uh, 2D materials had this sort of a hexagonal structure as a, I guess, back in the day, I was a theoretical physicist. Are there any studies as to, as to why that particular structure seems to appear more frequently in 2D materials than any other? Or, or are we on the cusp of finding some of these new structures that may not be <coughs> in form? Actually, that's a good question. I never thought about that. I mean, yes, we have, we have uh, graphene and in, in the zagonal boron nitride. I, I, I really don't know. I have never thought about why, why most of them are in the zagonal structure. Uh, uh, for example, for graphene, they have to form the hexagonal structure because the way that atom, the carbon atom has to form three bonds only because the fourth atom, it's, uh, the fourth electron is uh, uh, not bonding. So you have to form it because to form this, this, this angle, this um, structure. And I think it comes from this, for the fact that they are layered material. And then you have some, for example, in, in, in phosphorine, you have lone pair electrons. You have electrons that are not bond because they, uh, the fourth, the, 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 the extra bond will not form. I think it comes from the fact that you have reaction in range of atoms and some electrons, they are not uh, participating in the, um, in the interaction. Thank then you. Then they become layered material. So I would think that. Superb. Um, we've got two, two questions from uh, people listening. So I'll start with uh, Akshat. Akshat's asked, does the temperature need to be 1.7 Kelvin for superconducting transitions in twisted bilayer graphene? I've heard it can occur at room temperature also. I'm not aware of that, but I'll hand that one to you, Juliana. Oh, I, I didn't hear about it either. So uh, for, for graphene, what I know, this is a study that I showed in 2018. Uh, that was a really nice study, actually. And they found superconductivity for lower than 1.7 Kelvin. And uh, I think that is still, for, 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 for graphene twisted by layer, that is still in a very low temperature. But this is actually considered to be quite high temperature, not, not too low temperature. I mean, it was, uh, obviously it sounds like low temperature, but if you look at other superconductors, they have limitations that are at much, much lower temperature. So that's not so low temperature in the community of superconductivity. But no, not I, I, I don't know about uh, room temperature superconductivity by layer graphene. 
Perfect. Um, and Mike, we'll go, go and stick with the graphene theme, but perhaps maybe a question that relates to the first half of the talk, Juliana. Um, so in, in terms of the concrete mix with graphene, he's, uh, Mike asks, do you just mix flakes of, of graphene into the concrete? And when does it stop being graphene and start becoming graphite flakes in paint? Um, which is a nice thought there, Mike. I didn't give that much thought. So uh, any any um, nuggets of information there, Julian? Um they don't they I, uh, they they I'm not saying that they be, they 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 keep being monolayer graphene in these composites. Uh, they may be multi-layer graphenes there and so uh, but they don't become graphite in this uh, this composite. Uh, but even if they become graphite, actually graphite is quite a strong material too. <laughs> uh, not as strong as graphene, but but the way that they are built, obviously, this is all controlled. And obviously, don't you want to lose the properties of graphene? Obviously, when we are going to build these this systems and we are going to mix them together, there is a lot of research going on to, to, to use uh, the most of the properties of graphene. So you don't want to lose them. So obviously, it's the, the, the mixing of graphene is there, and it's all controlled that you have single layer of few layers of graphene that you don't lose that. Uh, uh, robustness of graphene that you have there. Now it's all controlled and you are still uh, going to be uh, small, a few, a few layers of graphene or even single layers of graphene. But this is the whole point of, of the systems yet, that this is why we are taking too long to take off, to take off because it is all has to be very well controlled. So uh, you cannot just mix it uh, and, 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 and that's it. You have to be really controlled, controlling the what we are doing, or you are losing the properties of the material. Brilliant. And I'm going to indulge myself with the final question as well, Juliana. It's double double header here. Obviously, you know, sustainability of the environment is a real key issue currently. Obviously, we've just posted COP26. And I look at some of the materials here and some of the elements uh, that make them up. They're probably not the most abundant materials on the planet. Do you see there might be a potential for some of these materials to be made with more abundant material, you know, more abundant elements to maybe make these more sustainable? Obviously, silicon was a was the wonder <laughs> material, wasn't it? The wonder element, because it was so abundant and we could do lots of things with it. But I look at some of these materials and wonder, well, actually, they might be rather limited based on their abundance. I don't know what your thought on that might be. Oh, what, what I think you might be is, well, there is a lot of research going on in two-dimensional materials and people you want to synthesize them and want to, to study them theoretically, there's a lot going on. But the point is when they were going to an industry and we are going to put this real uh, world application and then the limitations of the availability of the materials will play a limitation. And some of these materials, even if they are promising, they will not check off because of this. So we, st we, we still have materials like, let's say, uh, tin dioxide that you use, for example, in the screen of your, your smartphone. This is a very rare material and it's very limited, like very scarce material. So and if you can replace them by carbon, by graphene, then you are, you are, we are uh, replace a material that's really rare for a material that's very abundant. So graphene is also taking off because of this, it's carbon is very abundant. But some of these materials, what I, I know it's going to happen is that they are not going to take off. Because of this, uh, uh, you may you may need to do modifications. You may people may found out that all the materials that are more abundant would be better or will be equivalent, and then these materials will take off. I think yes, this the problem of the uh, how rare the element is. It is going to play a limitation in most of these materials. Yes, it's, it's kind of very wonderful the properties, but yes, we have to think that some of these materials they are rare and probably they are going to be very limited used in the um, in the industry. That's exactly as I thought it might be. Yeah, brilliant. I, I'm going to ask one final question before I post uh, the next uh, talk and the details in the chat box. Mm -hmm. If you had to pick one of these areas, obviously we've got a whole variety here. Um, which area do you think is going to be the, I know it's almost the million dollar question, but the next big thing, obviously all the research papers that you posted here were probably all within the last, <coughs> I don't know, three or five years. So I would call that relatively cutting edge in comparison to some other fields we've had talks on. Um, so where do you think this will pick up pace and where will be the next big thing coming from? Or could it potentially be all of those areas? I don't know. What's your view on that? I, I, I believe that what I talked later about twistronic, that the twisted layers, it's, it's now is the most, um, it's the hottest topic, I would say. 
I mean, they, they it just is recent, like three years ago, they published this paper. There was a lot of talks from the group that did this and a lot of other groups doing, trying to do the same. They are trying to twist several different layers, uh, different materials and graphene and mix them and try to twist. And I think you can get some, some nice properties there. And I think that's, that's something that at this moment people have been, has been focused on. Thank you, Juliana. Well, that's been fantastic. There doesn't appear to be any more questions and we have finished perfectly on time. So we've done brilliantly there at quarter past eight. So, just as a, so first and foremost, thank you very much for the talk. It's been fantastic. Thank you to everybody that's joined us. Um, and thank you to those that have asked questions. We have one more talk this calendar year um, and the details I've just popped in the chat box. It's Dr. Patricia Smith of the University of Birmingham, who's going to be giving us a very interesting talk on gravitational waves. So we, we've gone from 2D materials to uh, large astrophysics properties. But I think that's the beauty of this programme is that there should be something for everybody. So once again, thank you very much, everybody. The link is there to sign up. Juliana, thank you very much for your time and effort this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and I'll see you again next month. So bye for now. Bye bye.